One of the things that um, has become clear to me uh, during my time here, especially with this program, is that there is an intentionality in the community for opening up space to be able to have conversations about finances and what financial health and well-being looks like. Uh, not, f not financial health and well-being for everybody, but what financial health and well-being looks like for me. When I first got an email that I had to go to Pathways, I was annoyed because <laughs> I'm like, here's another meeting that I have to go to on top of a long list, a to-do list. Um, but going to the meeting was not just beneficial to my own personal well-being, you know, my personal finances, you know, how I'm budgeting and checking my bank account and making sure that I know where my money is going and getting all the the information about taxes. And so that was important, yes, for my personal development, but it was also really important because it really made me think about how fortunate and how privileged I am. And for me, the question came up, how do I get more aware about finances and how do I make others aware about finances and those who do not have? And where does social justice play into all of that? And what does it mean to um, be a proclaimer of the gospel, um, the good news. I think it also means to be aware and not just, you know, telling people what they want to hear or telling people something that, you know, um, makes them feel good, but also telling people the truth. And the truth in our society means that we have to be financially responsible, not just for ourselves, but for others. So it really started those wheels turning for me. Um, and I started to make connections between my personal um, finances and um, the gospel and what does it mean to be a minister. One of the things that I find really interesting in thinking about how to incorporate money into theological education, conversations about money, is the first thing that happened to me was that I started to notice how often we use monetary metaphors in our theologies. We don't even recognize that we equate debts with sin. We moralize money within our theological systems. And so the first step for me in incorporating this into my classes was to recognize where I was using those metaphors and how I was using them in pejorative kinds of ways. For example, I taught a class on debt and theology. It was just a one credit readings class. But one of the things we realized was that it was very difficult for us to talk about debt in some kind of value neutral way. We tripped over our tongues a lot. We kept talking about sin as debt or debt as sin rather than talking about the social structures that support uh, unjust systems of credit and debt. We also started realized that we started to put God into these categories of the one who holds our credit, um, the one who we owe debts to. At the same time then, those who hold debts in our society we see as morally inferior to the rest of society. And by doing that, then we are constantly putting ourselves in a space where we're not understanding fully what forgiveness is. Nor are we understanding fully the redemption that God brings to us. And so by unpacking these metaphors about money, these metaphors about debt and credit, we started to see a new theology, or perhaps an old theology, of forgiveness. We started to understand what grace was more fully when we started to question the ideas of the moralization of debt. An aspect of the Divinity School's financial well-being program is peer mentorship. As a business undergrad, I come to Divinity School with a different perspective on money matters and am more comfortable talking about these kind of things. So as a peer mentor, I've had the wonderful opportunity to develop a budget spreadsheet that students can use to project their upcoming expenses to better prepare themselves for the amount of student loans they need to take out at the beginning of a semester. It's been a really great opportunity because I've had a chance to engage students, one of my other passions, connecting with individuals, and to help them understand that money doesn't have to be a big scary thing, but with some careful planning, we can overcome the obstacles it presents. 
One big obstacle that people have talked about is the amount of shame they feel when they talk about either borrowing a lot of money or coming from a background where their family cannot support them very much. But I've started to see a shift more towards having conversations or including conversations around our spiritual health and money. Uh, so something that a lot of people I probably experience, I know I have experienced, um, around money is potentially feelings of shame or guilt. There are things um, people often equate, especially in this culture, um, people will often equate how much they have in the bank or how much material wealth with their value as a human being. And one of the things that um, the Financial Wellbeing Program has been able to offer is conversations around how our finances can impact our spiritual and emotional well-being. Jesus tells us to give all that we have to the poor and follow him. This is something that we all struggle with and to follow that ideal is a glorious kind of mission and work, um, work of compassion in our world. And yet we hear in Luke 8 that Jesus had women who walked with him in this journey, who had the means to care for his physical needs. There's a tension there then between having enough to be able to do our ministry and having an abundance that keeps us from that ministry. And I think that tension is one that I hope my students will engage not only in terms of their ministry, not only in terms of the larger social structures, but in terms of their own personal finances. Mm -hmm.